Okay, let's get started. Today we've got, um, I just wanted to cover the rest of the term because I'm shifting the things around a little bit here. Um, we were um, going to talk about promotion today. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to push that back until next week because we have a guest speaker coming in from a company called Ad Parents, and they've done quite a bit of good work in this area. Plus, of all four Ps, um, uh, promotion is at least a concern for me, for you guys in terms of teaching because you guys are uh, fairly up to speed in terms of social networks and how to, how to proceed with that and some of the other stuff. So, but what I am going to do today is I, I want to talk about uh, pretty much st strategy and tactics relating to how to apply the first three Ps that we, the, the three Ps that we're talking about with your actual project. I want to give you some helpful hints so that you can start connecting the dots so it makes it easier and easier for you to understand how to put this all together. Because as you see, we're winding down uh, here, and, uh, and these, these will be the uh, presentations, okay? So that's what I want to do. I'm going to accomplish three things today. I'm going to talk about price strategies. I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about brand, brand strategy, and I'm also going to talk about engagement, retention, monetization, and viralization, putting that all in. I'm going to give you live examples so you can apply that uh, for yourself. Before we get started, does anybody have any questions? Okay, cool. All right, all right, let's get moving. Now, as we discussed, and as I want you to understand, is that price is the most important of the four Ps, and the reason it's the most important is because it's the only one that you could change instantaneously. For example, the entire, um, the entire airline industry would, would probably not even be up and running if it wasn't for dynamic pricing, the ability for them to change prices quickly and adjust their loads. Because as I said last week, the, um, average, the average net income on a plane ticket is about $7. So unless there's a huge sophisticated level of people that understand how to price things versus their marginal costs and other things, then it becomes very difficult for the, both the company and the industry to make money. So that's, that's going to be an important thing. And I want to I kind of review this one more time because it's the, it's the easiest way for you to get, um, um, what, what would I say, skipped up in your presentation in the sense that the product and the price and the distribution don't match. They don't match. For example, you say, you know, I want to have a, I'm going to come out with a line of diamond rings and I want to sell them to Walmart. And, I, and it doesn't match. It, you know, in other words, the, the channels aren't. Or I'm Nike and I want to sell my product to Walmart. You know, there's strategic reasons why these things don't match. So you got to make sure that, that each one of the P's match as you go along because that's going to be an important function of whether you're going to be actually eventually successful. So I want to go back here again to this, this graph. It all starts with demand, right? It all starts with the notion that in a given product, whether it's an adhesive product or whether it's a widescreen TV or whether it's a, uh, um, an ounce of CBD, okay? All of the products ge generate what is known as the demand curve. And the demand curve is basically that people value things differently. People value the same things differently as well, right? Some people value a movie ticket uh, at a, at, 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 in one price, and other people will value a movie ticket at another price. And this is all reflected in what we call the demand curve. Now, the demand curve is in fact theoretical, right? There's only, I guess, the, the biggest, um, closest we've ever gotten to see what the actual demand curve is for a given product or a service was at the University of Chicago. Stephen Levitt is a famous economist at the University of Chicago, and he's actually constructed, using actual data from Uber, he's constructed the demand for ride sharing in New York City by using actual data. But usually it's a theoretical point of view. But, the, but that's not the, the issue that it's theoretical shouldn't keep you from understanding what you're trying to accomplish, right? Because, because if you need to understand the basic underlying theory of the demand curve, meaning that the lower the price of something, people will consume more of it, 
okay? It's, it's, it's an important function. And again, we've discussed marginal revenue. Marginal revenue is, in fact, derived from the demand curve. It's simply the revenue created on each additional sale that is made. And down here, when we have marginal cost, and the marginal cost, again, is independent of demand, right? The marginal cost is the, is the cost of making one more item in your plant for this. So let's step back and let's look at post-it notes, right? Post-it notes, there are a, there's a demand that will, for post-it notes, uh, and the demand has, has grown over time. It's experienced its product life cycle. Post-it notes are a mature product, and what has happened in the post-it note business is uh, 3M had a, a um, they had a uh, patent, which has since expired, uh, but they'd have the trademark color, the yellow color, trademarked. So they have some protection there. But at any rate, 3M's marginal cost is down here, and their pricing is, is based strategically on something that we could theme here. What, so if they have power, and in fact, if you have, a, if you have a product or a service that you think is unique and that you don't have a lot of competitors and that you think you can convey the value of that product accurately, you should choose the profit-maximizing price because that's, in fact, what the firm is involved with. That's what you're there for. You're there because you want to engage in an activity of a commercial nature where you trade what you have for somebody else that wants what you have. And if, and only if, you have the ability to charge whatever you want because it's a unique item, if you charge the monopoly price, you will be creating a situation where you have the maximum profit, okay? And at the maximum profit level, that's great for you as a corporation. It's not great for society because society isn't getting the true value out of that. What happen, where the true value comes is in a free market when people start competing. Because when Post-it Notes comes out and they set a monopoly price and someone else comes by and says, you know, I can't get around the adhesive, uh, I can't get around the adhesive patent, but maybe I can put something else onto it. It's maybe not as good, but it's kind of like it, and I don't have to worry about patenting it, and I can come out with that and I'll charge a little less and I'll try to take their market from them. This is the natural reaction in a free market, okay? In a free market because the market can sense that you've set a monopoly price. We went back earlier in the term, why does everybody hate Comcast? Everybody hates Comcast because they should. Because Comcast is, is, uh, participates in a monopoly pricing scheme. Now, they're not, they're, not, they're not breaking the law. They're not breaking the law. But they are practicing monopoly pricing. Why? Because there's not, there's not five uh, wires that come into our house, which is what they have in South Korea. South Korea has the fastest internet in the world, and the reason is, is when you go into an apartment in Korea, there's four different lines that you can choose from of four different high-speed internet. So in that case, you ingest competition into it, and you've got that thing going on, right? So that's the important thing to be concerned with. But as the market moves, of course, we move down this scale. And what was it this morning? Disney just launched its, its, um, its, uh, its sharing program, like Netflix. It's competi- what was it? What's it called? Disney Plus. Seven bucks a month? I think it is. So Disney Plus is getting into the content delivery business. Why? It's in their interest to do it. Why is it in their interest? They have tons of content. And what's the marginal cost of delivering that content for Disney? Zippo. Zeros and ones, right? So the race is on. And so what you're going to see over time is Netflix pioneered this area, right? Netflix pioneered the area, and they set a, uh, a price, probably a competitive price or something, to engage people in this. Now what's happening is that price is being gone. Apple's getting into the business. Disney's getting into the business. The content people. And that price will be bid down eventually to what is the competitive level, which is what? Good for you and I. We get to see cheap movies from Disney. 
and we like that better, and the world's a better place, and we don't kill each other. That's the objective. So as this thing moves down the ladder, this is how the normal market works. Now, the normal market, the normal free market isn't nice. It's not nice because every time this move happens, um, somebody has to react. They, they call it, uh, you know, you're disrupting an industry, right? If we, if in our seaweed business, we are able to extract the lowest cost protein on earth because we got the sharpest scientists in the food science department at Oregon State and our protein doesn't taste bad, like a pea protein, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is we're going to have giant farms producing seaweed on the Oregon coast. It's going to be a bigger industry than the wine industry, and the people aren't going to want yellow peas. Stephen, uh, um, James Cameron just invested, uh, I don't know how many million dollars, in a yellow pea processing facility in the middle of Saskatchewan, Canada. And he wants to save the world. He also wants to make money. And so the point is, is that he's making that statement, that capital investment statement is coming in, and he's convinced that pea protein is going to be the protein of the future. Is it? It is until we get there. Huh? And what are we going to do? We're going to be competitive. And that's how it works. So when we get down here to the competitive price, this is where all the action ends up. It's called a race to the bottom. This is where the action ends up. Most, of, most, in, most free, efficient markets, are the battlefields are right here at the competitive price. And that is where there is no economic profit for the, for the manufacturer. That doesn't mean there's no profit. That just means the profit has been bid down so it's one penny more than if I just put the money in a, in a, in a savings account. That's where, that's where we're at. So this is where the fighting. So if, it, if everything ends up here, what happens? Well, companies make the choice, right? Companies that have a lower marginal cost and can reduce their marginal costs can still sell product at the competitive price and make a profit because they have a low, lower marginal cost structure than their competition which is what Walmart, that's what made Walmart such a great company, is they were able to bring in product at a lower marginal cost. There's another way to skin the cat in price. The other way to skin the cat is on the demand side. So you can actually, if you can take that, if you can take a competitive product and you can drive the demand curve out and to the right, you can create a space here where you can create profit where no profit existed before. And if you have both increased demand and low marginal cost, and you focus on both of those, your strategy, your company will be a winner. And in the meantime, what happens is the consumer keeps getting better prices, better quality product, and, and is, gets more value over time. And that's how that works. But I want to give you an idea. I want to put it into a framework that you'll understand from a strategic point of view, OK? Because price, I said, is I need to make the argument, and I need you to understand why I, why I think price is the most important thing. Um, so let's look at an example. And the example I want to give you are, um, you've recognized these. These are uh, discount stores. These are discount stores, and they're shown in, uh, we're going to show you a different target markets, OK? So you have Walmart, Target, and Dollar General. Dollar General and uh, these guys. So if you look at race and ethnicity, which is one target you could choose as you're segmenting your market, uh, this, is how all, this is how these guys uh, stack out, OK? Fairly the same. It looks like family dollars, uh, 40%. This is white. Black, non-Hispanic, Hispanic others, OK? So what you can see is these are fairly similar eth you know, uh, from an ethnic perspective, OK? That's one thing to understand. From a generational perspective, it's a little bit different. 
You've got baby boomers, which is me, the guys that are dying. Hello. 46 to 64. Uh, looks like Dollar General. We're, we're really big fans of Dollar General. Why? Eh, we're retired. We live on the coast. We don't have a lot of money to spend. We're on fixed income. We need that cheap wine, whatever. So that's where we go. Uh, seniors, same, similar way. Generation X, Generation Y, these are, these are ones that are experiencing different. Generation Y seems to like uh, Target a lot better than they like Walmart, something like that. So we can see these. This is gender of primary household. Uh, most of these discount stores, females, are the primary people that come into the stores. Now, this is all data that's been collected over time. Because, of course, these aren't private clubs like Costco, or you can go in and you can watch people go in and you can survey them and you know what's going on. So this is where we go when, when we talk about the, uh, uh, the, the different markets. Here's one on age. Here's one on age. Um, the, uh, here we are, that uh, number green, let's see, green target, this, this, this uh, segment of age likes Target more. This segment of age likes Family Dollar more. Uh, we got a few one in Walmart and this sort of thing. This is the data that kind of shows you what's going on. Well, OK, now you've got, let's see, one more. We've got income here. Um, less than $25,000 a year, Family Dollar wins out. If you're $100,000 a year, it looks like Target. See, so Target. And Target's an interesting perspective, right? Target has a brand name associated with Target. And um, um, they represent a little higher, higher uh, clientele in terms of uh, what, they, what, uh, what the average user is. Now, what does any of this mean? Well, what it means today, or what it has mean, meant for the last 100 years, is really nothing much, right? And the reason it's been nothing much is because when you're at Walmart or you're at Target or you're at Family Dollar, you don't, you don't have the chance to go out and interview someone to find out what they're, gonna, what they're looking for before they come into the store. Matter of fact, you have to set one price, right? You have to, it's called a price tag. And you have to set that price. So somebody has to decide how much we're going to charge for the bananas. Somebody has to, is going to have to decide. Well, if you've got all this data and you're wondering what to do, what most companies end up doing is averaging it all, right? Let's average it all. And so that's what most, most companies do. They average. And in this case, if you look at Walmart, or if you look at any of these, Walmart, the average Walmart consumer is a 50-year-old white woman with $50,000 of family income. That's what the average is. That's what Walmart does. Now, now I'm, not a, I'm, not a, I'm not a woman, and I don't make $50,000 a year in family income, but I shop at Walmart. So when I walk into Walmart, all I'm seeing is, average, is the average price. Because the average price is set for a 50-year-old white woman with $50,000 of family income. Now, is that good or bad? Well, it depends, right? It depends on where I am on the demand curve. So, so what happens is in some areas I'm getting a real bargain, and in other areas I'm not. And so the question then becomes, is, is, is that as good as it gets? Well, I don't know. We're going to talk about that. So here we are at Walmart, and this is the competitive level. And this is where the average price has been set. 50-year-old white woman, $50,000 a year. That's what it is. That's what they said, OK? So that's what their whole decision is based on. And that's Now, why they set that? at the competitive price is because Walmart has a lower marginal cost. And their strategy is very simple. They're, they know they've got the largest, mar lowest marginal cost of production. And because of that, they set their price at, at Target's competitive level. 
And because of that, they know they're competitive with the competition, and they're still going to make a higher than normal profit. And that's why they do it. So that's, what, that's fine with Walmart. But the problem is, up until Amazon or Google, the problem was is that you're leaving money on the table. Because not everybody is a 50-year-old white woman that has $50,000 a year. And matter of fact, uh, Walmart's got 12,000 unique customers every day. And every one of us is unique. We talked about the human paradox. Although sometimes we want to act as a group, a lot of times we exert our own individuality. We like certain colors, we like certain things, and we have certain preferences. And there's no way the average price ever works. Matter of fact, it's always wrong. It's an average, right? But it's the only thing we could do and the reason why that worked was because here's the, uh, this is the uh, group of people. And the reason it, it hasn't worked up to now is because when people come into a store and I'm looking for a big screen television, right? I don't walk in, if I, if I walk in just like with me, just me. I'm me, me, bald old guy. And I walk in, and I'm going to buy a big screen TV, so where do I go? I go to the TV department, and I look around, and I look at the prices, and maybe I get somebody to come help me. Maybe not. I'm kind of looking around. Make a decision, grab the product, take it out, and buy it. The thing that I don't have, that Walmart wishes that I have had, was a little thing on the, my forehead, a little piece of paper or something telling Walmart what I'd be willing to pay for a big screen TV. Because theoretically, if we look at the demand for a big screen TV, there are people that would be willing to spend $3,000 on a big screen TV. Now, if I walked into a Walmart and I had a tag on my head that said, I would like to spend $2,000 on a big screen TV, do you think Walmart would be able to find a way to do that for me? Sure. You know, they might have a way, well, you know, I'll, let me escort you over here, and they would show me a certain TV, and then this, here's your $2,000 TV. Whereas someone that had $1,000 on, the, on their head they might show them the same TV and say, here's a thousand, and they're still making money on both. It's called price discrimination, and that's one of the things that's really important. So you can imagine all these people walking in, and all these people that have different thoughts about what this thing is worth. What's the value of a big screen TV? And you, these people are all Walmart shoppers, and they're all coming in looking for a big screen TV. And they're all different, they have different demand sets, different demographic profiles, different financial characteristics, and that's the way the free market works. So what do we do? Well, in history, we've said, what we're going to do is we're going to set the average price, and that'll be the best we can do. And that's what we've done. Now, what the problem here is, for these people, we tell them to go home, right? We tell them to go home because we, we, we're not... If we sell product at below our marginal cost, we're going to go out of business. So we don't want this business. We don't want their business. So we have to tell these people to go off. But these people, if we could charge each one of these people the price that they want to pay, we could more than maximize our profit. Right? If we could reach into their mind and we could see them and we could do a Vulcan mind meld, and we could get them in the, in the parking lot and get into their head and find out what they want to buy, we could figure that out. But it's not possible in that setting. Now, that, if it, it, now where, where price discrimination got its start, actually, was in Hyde Park, Illinois, one of the first times it was ever tried. Uh, in the University of Chicago in Hyde Park, 
It was, a, it was a movie theater. And it was a movie theater in Hyde Park. And what one of the economists figured out was that during a matinee, the theater, and this again, this is in the mid 80s when people went to movies. I don't, that's a, you know what a movie theater is where you go and big screen and watch stuff. Um, but they realized that during, during the day, a matinee, that the, that the theater was half, half empty. And what they realized was that both regular people and senior citizens had different demands for a movie. And they thought about it and they said, well, gee whiz, the marginal cost of an additional seat in a movie theater is very little because there's not, they just sit and watch. The movie's on for everyone. So this is when they developed what they call the senior discount. And they gave a discount to seniors because seniors had a more elastic demand. So they could actually discriminate against non-seniors by looking at them. And if they had a bald head, they guessed that I was a senior, and they could give me a better price recognizing that my demand. And this was the first time anybody thought about price discrimination in a big way. And it worked. And it worked big time. Now you had two different people, groups of people, sitting in, a, sitting in a movie theater next to each other that paid two different prices for a product. Revolutionary. Revolutionary. And that's what, and that's what happened. And that was satisfying for a lot of people uh, for a long period of time because that's about as far as the technology could push us, right? We could, we could show old people from young people. We could kind of, you know, we could ask for their ID if they were over 65. We could give them the senior discount and that sort of thing. But other than that, we were pretty stuck. And we were pretty stuck until these guys came around. And Amazon came around and instead, Amazon came around and instead of saying, like Walmart, we're going to be the lowest marginal cost producers, we're going to sell everything at the competitive price, they began to have a conversation with you as a customer, which is called symmetric information. In other words, you signed on, you became prime because you were in college and you got a discount and you started ordering from them and they started knowing you. They started knowing you. Walmart never had that opportunity. Walmart has, next to, the, next to the Department of Defense, Walmart has the largest computer in the United States. And Walmart's tracked through scanning. Walmart has tracked every purchase that's ever been made. And you can find out how many bananas have been purchased at 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the afternoon in Kokomo, Indiana, and compare that to 10 years ago. They know where every banana has ever been sold. And that's valuable, but it's not perfect, right? Because they don't know who bought the banana. And Amazon bridged that gap through technology. They know exactly who bought that banana, and it was you, you banana fiend, who bought the banana. And they practice this symmetric information. Now, why is that important? The biggest thing that that's important is if you can develop a symmetric information relationship with your consumer, you can discriminate on price, and you can increase your profit. So let's look at the old way, and then let's look at the new way, and let's see how the free market is making markets more efficient, and how this idea of symmetric information is making pricing decisions easier, and it's making the markets, and it's creating more value. In the old days, um, you had a company like Nordstrom's, and Nordstrom's would be in the fashion business, and I don't know if it's changed, but I was in the fashion business, if you can imagine, for a few years. I was in a, uh, um, Opal Man I owned an Opal manufacturing company that made Opal jewelry. And um, fashion, for all practical purposes, gets started in Milan, Italy. Then it moves from Milan to France, and then it goes from France to New York and LA. And fashion sort of births itself in that sort of way. And fashion is, is um, 
is a, is a value to a lot of people. Fashion, having the fashionable items is a value. Whatever is in, okay, whatever is in. So in the, in the old days, the way it worked was, and forgive me because I'm not fashionable, my wife's reminded me that on many occasions. This is, this, assume this is fashionable, this green thing, this shirt or whatever. This is fashionable. And because the buyer from Nordstrom's went to Milan and people were wandering around wearing this. So this is what they want. Now, in a world of, of asymmetric information or a world or a pre-Amazon world, we would have to do a lot of guessing if we wanted to bring that fashion to value to the, to the consumer. We would have to guess and make a lot of average. The first guess was, how many are we going to make? How many of these do we make? Second decision is, what size? What size do we make? Sizes change, you don't, you know, how do you, how do, you do that? These are decisions that you make. And the reason why these are important decisions that need to be made is because you have to give an order about a year ahead of time to some factory in some country, and they have to sit down and they have to make a million of these shirts, or whatever you decide. I want 300,000 extra smalls, 300,000 mediums, 300,000 larges, and I need them delivered by Thanksgiving. And you give an order, and usually the companies have to pay almost half their money up front, and then they have a letter of credit, and they have to pay for it. And that's what happened. So they said, so somebody's got to make a big decision, and they say, make these, and they give it to a factory, and they start making those products. And what happens then is they make those products, and they take those products, and then they put them onto a, uh, into a box, and they put them into a container, and that container goes somewhere over to the United States. It, it, it goes into Seattle Harbor, and it is parked, and it goes into a warehouse in Seattle, and that's where it sits. And it sits there until somebody wants it in the store, and it moves from the warehouse to the store, and when it gets to the store, they hang it up, and what they're hoping is someone will walk in and make the connection that this is a fashionable item, see the price, recognize the value, try it on, and if it fits, buy it. And that's where the value, and, that, and that's when Walmart, or that's when Nordstrom's win. Now, this is okay, right? This is how free markets work. This is okay. But it's pretty wasteful. It's pretty inefficient, right? Because there's a lot of guessing going on. How long is the trend going to last? Is green in? What happens if green, some, you know, uh, something goes on with the color green? There's also inventory. And for all you accounting majors, you know that inventory is kind of the bane of existence of a corporation. It's an asset, but it's not doing anything for the company because it's sitting somewhere not being sold. So it needs to be counted. It needs to be accounted for. It has to be LIFO, FIFO'd. It has to be figured out what are they going to do with it. And all it's doing is collecting dust. It's not, doing, it's not, it's not productive. It's a non-productive asset that's coming. You also have accounting. You have to hire people to account for all this stuff. And in the end, the chances that you sell every single one of these things and all your customers are happy is goose eggs. There's no chance, right? Very little chance 
that you're going to hit the mark because you're talking about statistical averages. So you got inventory, accounting, and waste in this whole setup. Well, here comes technology. Last year, this is a patent that Amazon applied for. Now, Amazon's deal is simple, right? We've talked about this a lot in this class. Amazon's deal is they want to hook your generation into being a lifetime customer. They don't care about me. Couldn't care less. They want you. And they want you, and they want you to be happy because they know that your, the present value of your lifetime earnings is going to be significant. And if they treat you nice and keep treating you nice, uh, you'll keep coming back. So here's a machine, and this machine looks complicated, but in effect what it is, it's a machine that can make one green shirt. One green woman's shirt. And it can make it, and it can sew it, and it can you know, cut it and assemble, and it can be QC'd, it can be packed, it can be shipped. One shirt. So theoretically what happens is you can look at all the trends you want. Matter of fact, you can even go to Nordstrom's and see it and try it on yourself. But you can go home and you can buy it from Amazon, and Amazon does what? They, they get the order, they wheel the machine up, and your single piece of a green shirt is made for you and shipped to you with that. And you can see from that standpoint um, how, the, how the information flow between Amazon and the customer works and how it's so much better for Amazon to be able to do this because they have no waste, they have no inventory, they don't have to count for anything, and none of that has to be put into their business. It does with Nordstrom, so they have to do that. Matter of fact, Amazon knows more about you, not me, because I don't do business with them. Why? Because I'm a biased guy. Um, but they know more about you than, than you think they know about you. Things like um, they're interested in knowing everything about you. They're interested in knowing what your waistline does pre-Christmas vacation and post-Christmas vacation. Because that's an opportunity for them. Uh, this is another machine that they've taken. Um, they've got a patent on. These, their intention here is to put these in malls and to get people in to just be surveyed, have their body surveyed for free. And they'll have all that information when you call up Amazon. They'll know everything about you, height, weight, et cetera. So once again, this is, a, this is using the price mechanism to make the, and, and it's using a channel strategy to create more value for a consumer. Um, and here we go. Oregon State discriminates on price. I don't know if this is still, it's probably gone up since I posted this, I've done this, but in-state tuition is $200 a credit hour, out-of-state is $700 a credit hour, you've got graduates and you've got non-graduate, you also have um, uh, online classes, hybrids, and this sort of thing. Oregon State discriminates on price because it's in their interest to do that. The marginal cost of delivering an online class is far less than it is one of these classes because one of these classes, you need, you, need a, you need a room, you need an AV department, all that sort of thing. Okay. That was kind of the nutshell in the price scenario. Uh, anybody got any questions on that? Cool. All right. The other real important one here, 
and again, this lecture is involving tactical things that you can use to decide to make your presentation and your marketing plan more compelling to me as your audience and your grader, because I want you to all do very good on this. So as we talk about this and as we lead down to the home stretch, of course, we haven't talked about advertising yet or promotion. We're going to do that. But we've got the four pre's, we've got your group project, but here's this overlying issue about branding. I want to spend a little more time on branding because it's very, very important that you understand how important branding is and that you can use branding to your advantage, especially with a product like what you guys are working on right now. So we got the four P's and we have what I call the four P's on steroids. So the four P's are product, promotion, price, and place. And because of technology, these have kind of morphed into uh, what we call engagement, retention, monetization, and viralization. And we're going to talk about each one of these. We're going to talk about engagement is the idea that instead of just offering something for sale on a random basis that hopes somebody picks it out, your engagement is similar to an engagement. Huh? I remember getting engaged. I remember that. I remember going down and buying, you know, an engagement ring. I remember they were very expensive. But it wasn't just a happenstance. An engagement means I'm trying to engage you for a lifetime. I want to get, I want to retain you. I want you to be part of my team. And this is the way I want you to think about it when you're thinking about your project. I also want to monetize you. I want to monetize you because I don't just want to give you value once. I don't want to send you, I don't want to sell you one product once during your life and say goodbye to you because getting a customer is too expensive. I want to I want, to, I want to engage with you, and I want to retain you for your life, and I want to monetize you. What does that mean? That means when you go to Amazon and you sign on, they know so much about you that they can pop up something, and you can't believe the value that you just got. I can't believe that they've, they've thought that through. It's exactly what I've been looking for. And monetization, of course, is the idea then that we can be a partner for life and we can do business and that you're happy with the value and the overall value continues to be there. And viralization actually is a word I made up, but viralization is the notion that we have the ability to, to spread the word, good or bad. We have the ability, because of technology, to sing the praises of a transaction we got, or also tell people, if you had a bad meal, you can go to Yelp and let them know, and the world now knows. So in the group project, here are the tactical things that you guys are going to be responsible for doing. You're going to choose a product, product line, or a service, and I want you to create a brand. I want you to create a brand. I want you to think about that. And along with that, a logo. Now, there aren't, we don't have the resources to have a single graphic design person or a design person for every single group. That's unfortunate, because we have a great design, we have a great design school in the College of Business. I wish we could incorporate it more. We have tried on occasion to combine that. Um, but for the, for the interests here is, talking to a guy that is nowhere near a graphic designer. So a logo can be a logo that's sketched out in pencil for all I care. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to pass any rigid tests of graphic design. As long as you can convey to me what you're trying to mean by the logo, I think that's an important characteristic. Then I want you to establish and I want you to justify the market. And you can do this through a number of different ways. You can do this through looking at data, like we talked about the Mintel database, which is, in, which is available uh, at Oregon State University library databases. 
You can do it by surveying your friends on your dorm floor or your sorority house. There's a lot of ways to establish and justify the market. There's another way, uh, many other ways of justifying the market in the sense that if you're competing with something that's already existing, that's a very easy way. But establishing and justifying the market is a very, very important thing. Okay? If you tell me that you are going to launch a line of ice cream cones on the North Pole, I might think that's a fairly innovative idea, but I'd want you to establish that people want to eat ice cream on the North Pole. And I want you to, you, and that, that's important. Creating the target is also an important idea. There are successful products that launch products and actually end up having a target market that's completely different than they originally thought. Marlboro cigarettes is a perfect example. Marlboro cigarettes was designed for women, housewives when it came out, Marlboro. And for 25 years, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was dead last in cigarettes. It wasn't until they got a guy, they dressed him up as a cowboy, they put him on the thing, started smoking cigarettes and driving around, that all of a sudden men started smoking Marlboros and it was, it was number one cigarette for many years. So you create the target. You price it and you're able to justify that market. And you have a choice, right? You can have a monopoly price, you can have a competitive price, you can have somewhere in between. Uh, you, can, you can choose that price, and that's it. Choose a promotion vehicle. We haven't talked about that. We will. And then, of course, decide on distribution partners, if any. And again, I want to talk, now I want to talk about brand in a deeper way and a more strategic way so that you'll get a picture of where I think you should be heading relative to this. Where all this comes down to is a thing we call brand equity. And brand equity is the notion that a brand is like a house. And a brand is a house that's a fixed asset that grows with value over time. And then if you treat that brand correctly, that brand will exist and will create value and maintain value as a very, very efficient way. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is. Uh huh. It's right in the. It's in the group project. Yeah, there's a rubric. Uh huh. And it's got all this in there. So, yeah, no worries. Thank you for that question. Um, so you have the brand equity. So it's based on profit, basically the net present value of the brand and um, your, the basically the strength and the power that it has. Here's an example. This is the old British Petroleum. British Petroleum is, uh, again, a British company that bought, I think, Sohio out, which was one of the standard oil companies that came. This was their old logo, and this is their new logo, BP. And they spent $211 million on getting that new logo. $211 million. This is Anderson Consulting. This is an accounting firm. They changed their name from Anderson Consulting to Accenture. They spent $100 million on making that move. I think this is the best one, because I, I, I can't figure out what. This is the London Olympics. And they paid somebody $625,000 to come up with this logo, this brand. These are. These are brands that you should see as familiar. The brand is associated with the product. The Keebler Elf is associated with the cookie. This is the connection that needs to be made in, in a branding setup. Oregon State did the same thing a few years back. Oregon State, just for the logo, um, spent $480,000 on a new logo. And it was interesting because I was in this class, teaching this class, when we made this logo change. And I asked the students what they thought about it. Most of them hated it. Most of them hated this, this, the, uh, the, the new logo compared to the old logo. 
And of course, that's your option. You know, that was it. And I can tell you though that the logo, Oregon State's logo, we chose because I was in the I was in the manufacturing business when I was in the etch glass and the etch metal business. Um, uh, I did business with all the top designers around the country, the graphic designers and the design. And this was a top, top designer called Pentagram, one of the world's top designers. They designed the 9-11 memorial and a lot of other things. So it really was top shelf, and this is, this is what they charge us for this logo. Um, and the comment I gave to the students when they said they didn't like the logo, my comment was it wasn't, it wasn't they didn't do it for you. They're doing it for the future people that want to look at Oregon State. But that wasn't very fruitful because they all thought it sucked. Here's what, here's what I researched. This is what Oregon State said, why they needed to change their logo. They wanted to more profoundly describe the product promise and the place we call Oregon State. They want to communicate the essence of the university, explore the frontier, solve pressing problems. This is, we innovate, we enrich our lives. This is what they want, this is why they changed. They changed from this, they changed to this because of that. That's what it was supposed to convey. Now in yours, what I'm asking you to do is consider a brand that you could give an argument to that might make sense relative to the market that you've decided to participate in. The brand also becomes not only a brand but an identity. Lyft and Uber are in the same space. They're both do ride sharing. Lyft is rides in minutes, and Uber is the smartest way of get around. They may have changed that by now. And so the idea that the brand has its own identity is really, really important as well. So the thing about when you brand, when you come up with a brand or look at a brand, what you want you to consider are the logos, Colors, type, font, other design. Now, of course, this isn't a design class, and I'm not going to grade you based on design, and I can just assure you that because I'm not a designer myself. I'm not capable of critiquing a design because I'm not skilled in that area. But I want you to give it a shot. This was the original Apple logo. Apple computer, and um, it's kind of nice, right? The reason why this Apple was because actually uh, Steve Jobs uh, went up to um, Reed College for a semester or two right in Portland. That's where he was sent. That's where he went to school. A couple terms, and he took a calligraphy class from a lady I know in the design field. And this was the original logo. Now, this, the idea here was, of course, Apple, computer, Apple falling on Newton's head, and this was very clever. Turns out, in the world of branding, though, this is probably not the most ideal way to structure a brand, simply because it's complex, it's very, very wordy, it's, it's uh, very rich, it's complicated design, and it requires a lot to think about. So this is where we, this is where Apple ended up settling on. Now, in terms of the value of the brand itself, what makes Apple such a valuable brand is when you when you talk about a brand, or you talk when they look at trademarks. When the U.S. looks at trademarking something, what they do is they look at does the word literally talk about the product itself. And to the extent that the, that, the, that the word or the trademark literally talks about the product weakens the idea of the trademark, right? And the example here is very simple. Apple itself doesn't have anything to do with computers. An apple with a bite out of it, if you ask a thousand people, does that, is it, does that mean, I mean, today this would, but originally. So the fact that they could use the Apple to define themselves as a computer company it means the strength of the brand. I'll give you an example. And these brands also need to be protected. 
they need to be protected and, um, and they need to be updated, and it's very important. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, Kleenex. Kleenex was a brand, but Kleenex was a brand that wasn't maintained and taken care of, and it fell into the public domain because Kleenex was a generic term that be. Escalator. Escalator was actually a, tr a trade name for something, a trademark for a company that made escalators. But escalators fell into this sort of gym. So the, the idea is to create a mark or some sort of brand name that can be created that tells the story in a very, very short period of time. Color is also important. Two-thirds, at least two-thirds of potential uh, customers' uh, initial reaction is based on color. That's pretty significant when people look at that and they say, color is a big deal. I'll give you a couple examples about that. Red. Red is a color that highlights excitement, energy, desire, aggression, war, violence. And if you look, of course, at things that exist in the, in the adhesive market, you can see for yourself how these brands are, are, are positioned. Post-it notes, scotch, Elmer's, this sort of thing. These are very distinctive brands, all trying to differentiate themselves. Pink is another color, love, romance, caring, acceptance. These are some ideas of pink brands. Uh, brands are in, uh, these are 
different brands. Yellow is another brand choice in color, joy, sunshine, happiness, philosophy. Here are some yellow brand choices if you want, post-it notes. So if we go back, yellow is sign of joy, happiness, optimism, that sort of thing. Tillamook, you look at uh, t like Tillamook, blue, peace, tranquility, calm, stability, security. Here are some blue ads. This is that uh, ice cream that's made out of um, chickpeas we talked about the other day. Purple is another one, royalty, nobility, cruelty, honor, orange, enthusiasm, green, Experience, renewal, vigor. Here are some green logos. Gray, sadness, old age. White, purity, simplicity. Now, of course, this is all really US based. Of course, white in Japan is the color of death, so you have to kind of watch from an international perspective what you're doing. But for the purposes of this class, we're dealing more in a domestic framework. Black, Elegance, depth, style, sadness, evil, fear. Now, when it comes down to fonts, again, we're not graphic design people. There are a few graphic designers in this class. But the idea here with fonts is there's many, many fonts to choose from. I'm just, uh, what I want to point out is a couple different fonts that are important in terms of how they, things are displayed. And the most important thing I wanted to point out to you is how these brands evolve over time, right? These brands do change. This was Starbucks' first logo in 1971, and it's, it's maintained until uh, today. Its, its logo has changed significantly from a brown to a green. And as you notice, they become, usually become more simple as they become more and more mature. This was Google's first uh, logo in 1997. Uh, it grew into that, and then it grew into the more clean. So if you notice in the evolution of brands, they usually start out as complicated, uh, trying to send too big a message, um, and they, they refine over time to where they get it. This was McDonald's original logo. This is how it changed, and now it's uh, into the uh, golden arches. This is... Um, how Amazon has looked in the same period of time. They, Amazon started out as a bookstore online and morphed into uh, there. As, as you can see, the evolution of these brands. Again, this, the purpose here was to give you a tactical feel for what branding and trademarking can do and what I'm looking for from you. I'm looking for you to brand something and spend a little time explaining to me why you did that and what your thought process was in terms of branding. Any questions? Okay. All right. Okay, now from what I want to talk about now is this concept of engagement, retention, monetization, and viralization. So the four Ps, as I said, the four Ps have, have remained the same since Kotler talked about them back in the 60s when he was at the University of Chicago and then moved up to Northwestern. Those haven't changed. What has changed is speed and content, and that's because of technology, right? This is a, new, an, uh, this is a newer form of engagement, retention, monetization, viralization I want to cover. And I'm going to give you an example that I think you can really relate to. This is what I want to do. So hopefully you really relate to this. All right, this is a gal that works in Portland. She has a job. And she, takes, she walks from her apartment every morning, and she takes the Macs to work. 
and then she comes home. This is her. Um, she has, uh, in the morning though, before she goes to the max, she walks from her apartment in the Pearl District. She walks down and she passes this coffee shop right here, which is an independent coffee shop. And she goes to here, she goes to Starbucks. Now why she does this, anybody could guess. But maybe she feels more comfortable with the Starbucks brand. Maybe it's cheaper. Maybe the place is cleaner. Maybe she wants to be seen on the Max with a cup that's got Starbucks logo on it. We don't know. But what we do know is that she walks by the independent store and goes to Starbucks. And she has a barista, and again, I'm not a coffee drinker, so I don't know the real price of coffee, so I picked $4. My only coffee experience is when my wife drags me to the corner of Tacoma and 13th Street in Selwood uh, for bonding time, and I watch her get her coffee, and I sit and talk with the neighbors, and she goes up there, and she speaks a language I've never heard. A double doobie dava dava do with extra food. And she gets what she wants, and they come back. All right. This person, along with millions and millions of other people that go and get Starbucks in the morning, has an algorithm. And an algorithm is nothing more than just a set of instructions. That's what an algorithm is. And an algorithm is, in this case, is she wakes up, takes a shower, gets dressed, walks to the max end, passes the coffee shop, buys, and goes to work. That's her algorithm. And the algorithm that she's established adds value to the day, otherwise she wouldn't do it. She feels better, or she's better off, or she thinks that she's better off because she goes through this algorithm every day. And that's important for marketing people, right? It's important for marketing people to think about because we're trying, to, we're trying to create more value for her. We're trying to look at what she values and we're either trying to mimic, mimic that value at a bargain or give her more value for the same amount of money. This is what we're trying to do because that makes the world a better place to live. And of course, this ends up being what we talked about early in the term is bias. These linkages that she's developed as an algorithm become a bias. I always do this. I like it, makes me feel good. This is what I do. It's a bias. And as we know, biases are inherent in every human being. And the older you get, the more biased you become. And you have to understand how to manage that. So here we go, she's walking to work before she gets onto the Mac. She walks to work one day, she goes past the, um, the independent store and walks in, and everything is the same except one thing. Instead of the smiling barista, there's a robot. And the robot, is making coffee. And the robot is making coffee. Now, I'll give you a little hint about the robot because it's not a live example. The robot is making the exact same coffee that she always liked. Making it in the same amount of time, exactly the same as she's always had it, that fits exactly with her algorithm. But, she, but this is something that has changed her algorithm, in a sense, because she's not physically able to smile at the barista or have a conversation. So a little bit of change. But Starbucks did this for whatever reason. And they didn't tell her 
They didn't bring her in. They didn't talk to her. They didn't tell her. They just did it. And she went ahead and she bought this coffee again, and she paid her $4. Now, nothing else changed. Nothing else changed. Well, I did this, I did this uh, a, a few terms back, and I sent out a Qualtrics thing, and I asked the students, um, given this change, what would you expect to pay? Because it was a change, because they went from a human to a robot. So I asked the class, and, I, and this is the result I got. 32% of the class would be very happy just paying the same price. In other words, the person didn't add any value. The person added no value to the transaction for 32% of the student population that, in this class. I don't care. I just want to get my coffee. I want it to be what I want. And I want to go when I want to get on the max and go to work. OK. So then we asked, would you expect to pay 350? Third of the class said, yeah, you know what? Starbucks isn't doing this to be nice to me. Starbucks is doing this to make more money, right? They got to be. They got to be doing this to make more money. They get, a, they get a robot rather than a human. They don't have to, don't have to give it a raise. No health care. Makes sense. So, the, so then 30% the of the class said, you know what? To compensate me for the fact that you just let somebody go, I want a better price on my coffee. Otherwise, I don't see the value anymore. Poof, the value goes right away. One change, boop, it's all gone. Then I said, 250. How many people would pay 250? About a third of the class said, you know what? Yeah. It's really worth that. I'm pissed off. I'm pissed off at this whole mechanical world thing. Right? This has gone too far. I want a human making my coffee, damn it. I don't care if it tastes the same. I want a human. I want a smiling person making my coffee. And then I asked, would anybody pay a higher amount? 5%. There's always a few. Right? So in this sense, this is, what, this, is, this is where we were with that. So here we had a group that had the same perceived value. Here they had less perceived value, and here they had a more perceived value. Now there's a math equation, right, that Starbucks could do. They could say, well, OK, the capital cost of a robot's a million dollars or half a million dollars. I prorate that over a few years. And I could afford to lose this many customers, and the company will make more money. That's one way to do it, right? Okay. But going to robots for a company like Starbucks that has a brand does alter their brand image. It does alter one of the things that they were that they stood for. Nike doesn't sell its brand to Walmart because they think it would hurt their overall business. People associate Walmart with cheap stuff. Nike doesn't want to be considered cheap. And there was this with less value. So in this case, 63% of the people felt cheated. And they blame the brand. Because there's nothing wrong with the coffee. 
There is nothing wrong with the coffee. The coffee is exactly the same. And 63% of the people blame the brand. Now, is that a problem? In a free market, you bet it is. Because in a one-period world, they could get away with that. Right? If I was over in some foreign country and I went to some company that was making coffee with robots, they could cheat me, right? Wouldn't matter. It's a one-period world. But Starbucks doesn't live in a one-period world. Matter of fact, Starbucks is, a multi, is around the world, and they're known for their coffee, and they have a brand, and they have something to establish. So I've screwed this woman's algorithm up. But she still has to go to work. She still has to go to work in the morning. And she, unless she takes an Uber, she's still going to walk and take the Max. But what's she thinking about now? She's going, you know what? I saw less value. I'm getting less value from that corner Starbucks. I'm getting less value. Doesn't matter that the coffee doesn't taste as I'm getting less value. I think it is. So one question I asked, and this was the, uh, was, after this experience, how many of you would check out the independent store? And 70% of the class said yes, which makes sense. 70% of the chance. So you have a brand. The brand's got an image. The brand has a vision. The brand is something. And you're living in your life, and it's in your algorithm. It's part of your bias. It's part of your life. You're in there. You're doing your job, and all of a sudden, Starbucks throws a robot in there, and they screw everything up. And what does that do? That says, you know what? I'm going to check these guys out. Uh, I'm going I'm to check these guys out. And the, and, 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 and the idea here, let's see. The idea here, let's see now. The idea here is... Fundamentally, that when you're engaged in a, in a commercial transaction with, with someone that you, with a brand that you associate with, the most important thing you have to consider yourself with is, is the brand that you created, is it living up to the image that you wanted to send? And if it is, you have a, you have a great opportunity to create more engagement, more retention, more monetization, and more viralization, possibly. And that people could, in fact, talk about it more and more and more. Does that make sense? Okay. 